Uh, yes, it's, um, reminds me of this I've quoted before the saying that if a, if a man says something in the middle of a forest and his wife doesn't hear him is he still wrong <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know whether you can hear me properly I was had a little complaint early on that you couldn't hear me but it's working all right again now Peter yeah fine and how about the video? Does the video look as good or better than before? Equally as good, if not better. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. So I'll show you, show, first of all, share the, the links. Uh, with a bit of luck, I'll just click the two boxes. Um, so here are the things I'm going to look at today. And um, the first Thing right at the top which says zoom settings and I discovered on um, the U3A website in Britain about how to, how to set your zoom to get better quality vision and better quality sound and this particular section sec, this one here um, is a video I think that we can run as well now these are, I've had a, had a go at these and they really work um, as, as I hope you can see that I look better, <laughs> even better, perhaps. <laughs> so um, I'll start off with, uh, where it, was it done? It's over here, isn't it, I think. Yes, um, can you see that? No, I don't suppose you can. Oh. Uh, hold on, let me just share a new, a new share to uh, this, uh, that one, yes. So you should now have part of the U3A website, which says technology help hybrid meetings. You got that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I scrolled, as I read through this, because I wanted to do some hybrid meetings, um, right at the bottom here was this little link to this chat Zoom um, thing um, video. Um, it talks about it here, all over here as well. But this particular video was uh, very good. I haven't looked at this particular one here, but this one I can recommend. And that's my next link and worth listening to now. Ignore him. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing there. Right. Click on that. To one platform when you can simultaneously live stream to every platform. To Lucidchart makes intelligent diagramming uh -oh. easy and helps your best I ideas become the ads. Real. Discover new audiences faster using oh, Restream.io. Oh, here we Wouldn't are. it be nice in Zoom if you could get your video quality to not look like hot garbage on a call? You know, Zoom by default smashes your video down to what resolution? You may think it's HD. You may think it's 720p. You may think it's 1080p. You may think it's 4K. Because when you're using Zoom, it shows you this nice, beautiful image, like you see right here, of your preview of yourself. And so you think that you look that good on calls with other people, but that is not true. You do not look that good on calls with other people. That's only the preview for yourself. The way that you look on calls with other people on Zoom is 360p or 480p. That is the maximum quality that they give you in Zoom. It should be way better, but it's just straight up not way better. Sorry. How now you see on the right hand side here, the HD settings show here, this video is at 1080p, like he was saying. Oh, yeah. How okay. do you get your video? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Hello, let's just admit Peter. How did you bring that menu room. up, Peter? Sorry? How did you bring that menu up? Oh, well, on the bottom right hand side where you can right. maximize the picture, there's also a, a little a cog wheel. Oh, no, it's oh, got right. a little re red mark on it, which says. Oh, fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can see it now, can you? Yep. So we don't need it anymore. Right. So I'll go back to his speech. Hello, Peter, by the way. Morning. Sorry I'm late. Well, I'm talking about how to improve the quality of the image and the sound on your Zoom when you're talking on Zoom. Uh, Zoom automatically crushes the video down to 360 uh, pixels high. And this, this particular picture is, as you will see, 1080 pixels high. So three times the quality, if you like. Yes. So 
This is um, a Yankee, but he's pretty good. And I have to put up with his accent. But he, what he's talked about is quite well done and quite instructive. Video quality up to actual HD, you may be asking. Well, that's what you tuned into this for, right? So there's a secret menu to do that, okay? So the first thing that you want to do is a couple key settings to set yourself up for success doing this secret feature called content from second camera. So go into your video settings down here and pull open your video settings menu. There's a couple that you need to enable. Make sure you do not have original ratio on. That will make your video size weird. Don't do that. Make sure you do check HD, okay? And there's a couple other features here people get confused about with Zoom. You can mirror your video if you want. That does not affect your quality. All that does is just flip your video left to right, depending on how you want it to look. That's a nothing burger feature. It's your preference which side you want to be on, okay? The next feature that you want to not use is touch up my appearance. So if you use touch up my appearance, this will smudge your video quality and make you look weird. So let me just show it to you. You see, I don't know if you, how well you can see it right now. But as I touch up my appearance, my face begins to look weird and unnatural. Look, this is with it on. This is with it off. On, off. When you look at it close up, it actually makes your face look weird, man. It, it's like it's like a soap opera. Don't turn that on. It drastically decreases your video quality in Zoom. Okay. And the next one that you want to consider turning off if you have lighting in your space, which you should, is adjust for low light. You do not want to have this feature on. Uh, it will make everything brighter, as you can see, but it will overexpose you sometimes and it'll like jack up everything, all the colors, and overexpose you, especially if you are white or you have a lighter color skin like me. Um, I, I've seen uh, Asian and Hispanic clients have issues with this too. It'll make your skin look splotchy uh, if you use that feature. Do not recommend it. Great. So now that you've done all of that, how do you turn your video quality from 360 or 480p garbage into good quality? All right, let's do it. So where you're going to go is you're going to go down here and you are going to disable video. <laughs> you're going to be like, what? Hey, well, what are you talking about? disable video in the normal video spot all right then you're going to go to share screen down here at the bottom so you're going to do screen sharing to do this you're gonna be like what a wall what is this janky workaround where are you taking me on this journey all right it's going to default you to the basic tab here on this menu that pops up all right that's not where we're going we're going to the advanced tab this is where the secret 1080p video feature is for you to punch through sick quality all right and the feature down here in the corner is called content from second camera right down here so why is this hidden away why does zoom hide 1080p video away so this feature is designed for old school professors and stuff who have document cameras what what is a document camera you may be asking uh, professors used to have to like show physical documents like pieces of paper and books and stuff to their class and they had to project it up on the big screen in the front of the room if you went to college a while ago and so this feature is designed for that if you have to show a physical book or physical piece of paper or something so this feature is 1080p because it's that that's like the overhead projectors we used to have and that symbol is like the overhead projector yeah. okay okay Oh, you're still alive. <laughs> As you can imagine, if you're trying to show a little book or a piece of paper on the screen, you need to have full HD or you can't see the details of it, right? So they enable HD only through this feature, okay? So you click content from camera and then you click share and watch what happens. Full 1080p video, not only for you to see for yourself, but the attendees see full 1080p video you will literally mathematically be two or three hundred percent higher quality than everybody else on your call every other webinar every other meeting you're doing by enabling content from second camera now if your con if your camera does not automatically pop pop up uh like mine does there's a switch camera button up here in the top hold on that was the sound effect I was looking for. There's a switch camera button up here on the top that you can use so you can switch between all the cameras on your computer. Maybe you have a virtual camera, maybe you have a DSLR, maybe you have multiple webcams. You click the switch camera button and you keep clicking it until your camera comes up and then boom, 
Now you are full 1080p in Zoom. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I just, let's just summarize what just happened. I just tripled your audio quality through Turn On Original Sound. Uh, you're welcome. And then I just tripled your video quality through content from Second Camera. A uh, you're welcome. But wait, there's more. I'll tell you the other secret things that are going to increase your quality here in just a moment after I say thank you to our sponsor, Restream.io. I am streaming on multiple platforms at the same time right now. And Restream is helping me grow my audience as a streamer. I recommend it to my consulting clients and I recommend it to you. So if you are not already streaming to multiple platforms at the same time, do it. Use Restream. Why are you exclusive on one platform? That is idiotic. Okay? Unless they're paying you cash, you should not be exclusive on Twitch. Unless they're paying you cash, you should not be exclusive on YouTube. Unless they're paying you cash, you should not be exclusive on any platform. Stream to all of them at the same time. I'm doing that right now. And because I'm streaming to all platforms at the same time, just looking at my numbers here, I have doubled my viewership. Thank you very much, everybody who's watching across all of the different platforms. Greatly appreciate that. Cool? All right. Now let's go into the next features, which are going to drastically improve the quality of your Zoom calls. Okay, so here I am in the corner. I'm going to disappear for a moment. Boop. So in Windows, down here in the bottom, there are some settings in your Windows that you need to change and set that could drastically increase your audio quality while you're doing Zoom calls. What do I mean? Check it out. Go down here to your audio thing in the bottom right-hand corner. Right-click it and go to sound settings. It's buried in some deep, deep, deep menus on your computer to do this, okay? Follow me on this, trust me on this, it's going to increase your audio quality. Go to the sound control panel right here. Sound control panel. And I've got something else after this to tell you guys about as well, okay? Go to the sound control panel, and then what you're gonna do in your sound control panel, <laughs> this is why I'm calling it secret, it's a multi-layered thing you gotta do. Then you go to the recording tab, it's like you're going through a freaking labyrinth here. You're going through a labyrinth to find the settings. You go to the recording tab on your computer. Then find the microphone that you use in Zoom. Here's mine, okay? I've got the Shure MV7 microphone. All right. Now that you have finally dove, dove, dove this deep into the secret menus, right-click on that microphone and go to properties. But what? Do you see how ridiculous this process is to improve your stuff? That's why I wanted to do this video. How the heck is anybody supposed to figure out these secret features I'm telling you guys about today <laughs> on your own? <laughs> I know it's ridiculous. Okay, follow me here, okay? So what you're gonna do next is you're gonna go look at your levels, the levels tab here, and you're gonna wanna set your levels at the perfect levels manually here in Windows. Do not set your volume levels for Zoom in Zoom. Do not set your volume levels for any communications platform in that communications platform, it will be jacked. All right, so generally speaking, a good setting to start with is about 75, not 100. So set it as 75 as a baseline to improve that audio quality. But wait, there's more. Here's the secret part. Click the advanced tab, and then what you're gonna do here is you are going to go to the highest quality setting on this drop down menu. You're welcome, I may have just tripled your audio quality. You're welcome. But wait, there's more. You need to turn off exclusive mode. Why? Because if you turn off exclusive mode, it's gonna make it, and you hit apply, it's gonna make it so that Zoom cannot control your audio, and it cannot just adjust your volume up and down all willy-nilly like it wants, and you control your audio. Get it? That's exactly what you want to do. And so once you do that, now you can set the perfect volume level without any Windows shenanigans. You've increased your audio quality in Windows. Then you've enabled original sound. Now you, through all the secret menus I've told you about in this podcast, you now have professional level quality audio as soon as you hit that turn on original sound button and Zoom will not jack it up now because you literally banned zoom from being able to jack up your audio you're welcome <laughs> so trust me this will save so many problems so many issues for you guys along the way
We just tripled your audio quality and just tripled your video quality just like that. But wait, there's more. So not only are these software features really critical, but you need to have amazing hardware. And hopefully this doesn't break my mixer when I do this. If it does, it is what it is. Um, but you need to have great hardware to be able to do all of this. And so there's a couple cameras that I recommend that are, in my opinion, the best ones for Zoom, okay? And so those cameras include... Introducing Speechalo, the most natural sounding text to speech software on the market. Hey. Annoying, I'll skip the ads. You listen to this video until now and you This one right here, uh, I've got the, uh, let me make sure I Blue light disable on. this audio, perfect. Uh, so I've got these two cameras right here. I've got the Avermedia PW513, which is the best webcam on planet Earth, and the Logitech Brio. Those are the two best webcams that you can possibly use on a Zoom call, okay? And why are they the best? They have a glass lens, that's number one. Number two, they go up to 4K, that's number two. And then beyond that, they have a really ultra, ultra wide angle lens that they use on Zoom calls and it just looks absolutely fantastic. So I very highly recommend these two webcams. How can you find them? Where can you find them, you ask? Very, very easy to do that. I have an Amazon store page set up with just like gear specifically that's killer for Zoom right here. Let me just drop the link for you guys. You guys can check that out. This is just the best Zoom gear out there. I've set up corporate clients from multi-million uh, multi-millionaire stock traders to CEOs and what have you with all this gear. I've got all the best USB microphones as well as the best cameras all in this idea list. I just linked in chat. It's also in the description below. All on Amazon. Go shop this gear. If you have that good source video. If I'll stop it there, I think. Um... The only problem with all this, Peter, is when you haven't got enough bandwidth to start with, it's absolutely useless increasing all this because it will just knacker it completely. Well, um, does my video look better than it? Yes, before? but that's not the point. You've got enough bandwidth because you're using um, Virgin. But if I you did. were using BT, it would be useless. <laughs> Who's got BT around here? I think. Uh, I think. Uh, well, um, Pete, uh, yes, I see. Yeah, it is a terrible picture here of Alan, isn't it? <laughs> The trouble is, it's all very well increasing the sound and the vision, but you're taking up more bandwidth across the network, if that's the word for it. So what? Well, you're taking up more bandwidth. You're taking up more bandwidth. You can't get as many people in. Now that's an interesting comment. Yes. I wonder if that's true. Anyway, I thought I'd put that to you to see what you, uh, what you thought of that idea. I think it was quite some quite interesting uh, concepts there, and um, I, I might even get that one of those cameras he talked about. Um, yeah, what was the camera? It was a five one three, but what does it make? Uh, uh, Logitech. Uh, Logitech. AV... Logitech. Yeah. Sorry. Logitech. 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 Brio. Brio. That's one, and the Ava yeah. Media. Which Speech hello. Speech hello. So do we know how much they cost? Yeah, it's a price. Yes, I do. <laughs> they, they both cost around about the hundred and forty pounds. Uh, of course, the other problem with them is he says they've got wide-angle lenses. That's the last thing I want. This is so-called <laughs> not wide-angle, and it's still too wide. Well, mine's a wide-angle. You can tell by the curvature of them. So, yeah, right. <laughs> but a lot of those that, those cameras also have zoom facility, HD zoom. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it should be okay, I think, if they if you get one. But is yours a new camera, Peter? Sorry. Is yours a new camera? No, this camera I've had for um, two years at least. I don't remember yeah. seeing that curve before. Well, it's always been there. Oh, is it? Okay. I don't remember. Yeah. Very cool scene. Right. It was it was Richard's suggestion I get this particular camera. <laughs> don't, don't he's, he's, he's moved chairs though, uh, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. Over now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so um, quality of the pictures, I think, is is useful to know. 
Um, so anyway, there we are. Let me move on to um, another, another, let me get the right screen first. Move on from him to my very first actual, um, well, lost track of where I am now. I'll share this new screen now. So this was the first uh, um, link about early humans putting the heart at the best place in their cave for best heat, warmth, and the mi minimum smoke. Isn't that mm. clever? Um, so knew a lot about spatial planning. They controlled fire and use it for various needs and place their heart at the place, best place. <clears throat> mm. How did I figure that out? Um, what should the smoke? <laughs> <laughs> a groundbreaking <laughs> study at Tel Aviv. Yeah. Hmm. Third of the kind, they was developed a software based smoke dispersal simulation model applied <laughs> 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 into a known prehistoric site. <laughs> so, by fiddling about like that, they found, found out why, why it was in the best place. <laughs> um, so, what point did evolution did humans learn how to control fire and ignite it at will? When did they begin to use it on a daily basis? Did their use of the inner space of the cave efficiently in relation to the fire? Yeah, well, anyway, so yeah. um, multi layered hards have been found in many caves, indicating that fires had been lit at the same spot over many years. In previous studies using software based model of air circulation along with the simulation of smoke dispersal we found that the optimal location for minimal smoke exposure in the winter was at the back of the cave the least favorable location was at the cave entrance but mm. for smoke that's rather strange isn't it i suppose um, it used to blow in from the front of the cave yeah yeah well, I suppose being at the back, the smoke would travel along the, the, the roof and then out. Yeah, yeah so yeah. colder air would come in at the bottom. The bottom, yes. yeah. Yeah. In the current yeah. study, the researchers applied, applied their smoke dispersal model to an extensively researched, extensively studied prehistoric site, the Lazaret Cave, inhabited by humans around 150,000 years ago. Um, placing the heart at the back of the cave would have reduced smoke density to a minimum, allowing the smoke to circulate out of the cave right next to the ceiling. Just like you said. Um, in the archaeological layers we examined, the heart was located at the centre of the cave. Um, we tried to understand why the occupants had chosen this spot and whether smoke dispersal had been a significant consideration. To answer these questions, I performed a range of smoke disposal dispersal simulations of 16 hypothetical heart locations for each the so, You see the, the figure there of early humans 170 to 150,000 years ago. I, that's much earlier than I thought that we were called humans. Uh, really? Well, uh, what's your impression? When, when, when were we first humans? Well, it depends which one. Homo sapiens was 50,000, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. But the but, but Neanderthals and um, Denisoirans and the, the others, there they were quite a lot, weren't there? I mean, there mm. were loads of humans, weren't there, originally? And then we came out, sort of popped out at the end, didn't we? I think I've got another <clears throat> another article on, on that sort of thing later on, <clears throat> um, which we can look at. Yeah, that's good. It's, Another fascinating. Um, so, are they they are classing Neanderthals as humans? Well, presumably they are. Yeah, yes. they were. Well, they were. Yeah, they've just done the uh, human genome, haven't they? And gone back uh, and uh, found th things a lot a lot earlier than they thought, haven't they? Uh, yes. Yeah. Human dispersals a lot earlier than they than they thought. I wonder if this is this is this is used now because. Smoke inhalation and and particulates are one of the biggest sources of death in the world. And I, yes. you, you wonder whether you know have we lost this or what? <laughs> it's just that we got to put all our roads in tunnels now. Yeah, we're going. We're going to, we're going to live back in caves. <laughs> yeah, or make houses like caves. That'd be good, wouldn't it? 
here well, look, it talks about the uh, health implications of smoke here oh uh, it's terrible it's absolutely it's bloody awful average, but in this way four activity zones were mapped for each cave the red zone which is essentially out of bounds due to high smoke yellow for short term green to long term um, and blue area essentially smoke free so we found that the average smoke density measured on measuring on the number of particles per spatial unit is in fact minimal when the heart is located at the back of the cave, just as our model had predicted. But we also discovered that in this situation, with the low smoke density, most suitable for prolonged activity, is relatively distant from the heart itself. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So early humans needed a balance, a heart close to which they could work, cook, eat, sleep, um, while exposed to the minimum smoke, ultimately when all, all needs are taken into account, daily activities the damages versus the damages to smoke, the occupants place their heart at the optimal spot. <laughs> this spot uh, will identify the 25 square meter area in the cave which will be optimal for locating the heart in order to enjoy the benefits. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so, brilliant. That's interesting, I thought. Um, yeah. Never have thought that you could figure that out, would you? Yeah, you could look for the sock, couldn't you? Yes, well, uh, indeed. Um, would it make that, a difference if the cave had a dog leg in it? Huh? Well, that's a good question. That probably wouldn't make much difference, would it? There are some actual photographs of from 170,000 years ago. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what sort of camera is that? Sorry? <laughs> what sort of camera is that then? <laughs> I do have to do video one. <laughs> HD, HD minus. <laughs> <Yes. Okay. laughs> so I thought that was reasonably yeah, interesting. Good, that. Yeah. And that came from Eureka Alert. That's um, a, a thing that, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, his name now, Drat. On the um, my, my um, the the archaeological group part of the website in Salisbury often contains Eureka Alert um, messages. Uh, anyway, right, moving on to the next one. Hopefully, underwater photographer of the year revealed. Thought that would be a suitable thing oh, to yeah. look at. Um, in fact, we can. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, this was this one below is the best one of all, already. You can't really see it all like that. So if I shrink it the whole screen down, wow. you can see the whole image. <laughs> you still can't see it all. Huge image. Oh, I suppose it's nice, near enough. What there are are five whale sharks in the same frame. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And um, right. he explains here, which you can't possibly read now. Um, <laughs> I'll enlarge it again. Um, um, he explains how he did it. Um, they look more like spotted sharks than the whale sharks. Well, they're called mm -hmm. whale sharks, as he says here. Um, yeah, but he, there was a question on last night which asked you to distinguish between the two. Oh, really? Oh, which program was that? Uh, I don't know. The one where you got was to get zero score. Just just before the six o'clock news. Oh, I see. Oh, I didn't see that. Right. OK. Anyway. Um, uh... The new scientist always has a section now with um, photographs in it. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Does it? And they're, they're pretty, right. pretty good pictures. Well, we'll, we'll look at some of in a minute. But if, how he got these five whale sharks at once was interesting. <laughs> um, he said he counted 11 sharks that night, yeah. a once in a lifetime encounter. The picture, this picture came first out of 4,200 images from 71 countries. Wow. Anyway, uh, so he had to, he had to bait, bait the um, system somehow. I don't know what he did know. Um, I thought it said how he did it. And Matt Smith, now living in Australia. There you go. Um, and he did it, he did if it's made out of 4,200 images, can you call it a photograph? No, 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 you've got that oh, wrong. No, no, the entry 
to the competition. Best, you? Oh, yeah. I see. All right, fair enough. I'll do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this was this um, uh, white, great white shark in, a, in southern Australia. What a lovely place to live. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So that was uh, Matty Smith. That's his picture. And um, oh, yeah. with a dome around the camera and a carbon pole and a remote trigger. <laughs> well, I don't blame him. Um, yeah. I designed and constructed my own equipment to get the camera exactly where I wanted it. Surprisingly, the sharks are instantly attracted to the camera. In fact, it was a battle to stop them biting it. <laughs> so here we go below to others. Um, <coughs> macro mimicry from Javier uh, Javier uh, Murcia from Spain. I'll have to. Oh, yeah. So there's this pipe fish. Um, Looking like seagrass, apparently. Seagrass yes. shrimp, I think it's called, that's right. Uh, and the seagrass pipefish. Oh, no, there's two there. There's one here. This green one is the seagrass shrimp. <clears throat> I'd forgotten it was there. <clears throat> <clears throat> that's something I didn't know about. Both species live in the leaves of seagrass. <clears throat> so, uh, yes. Anyway, so that's that one. The wrecked Rex, abandoned ship by Alex Dawson from Sweden. So this is another one that's so big, I think. Look at the lighting on that. Wonderful. What do you reckon, Richard? Yes, very nice. You can see oh, the you have all the equipment and the snorkel gear to do any of these. Oh yes, quite. Yeah. Does it say anything here? Um, the wreck of oh, there we are, that's it. here it is. The wreck of the Tiri Fjord, uh, one of the favourite wrecks um, near Norway, approximately 130 feet underwater. The highlight of the wreck is always the huge steering wheel in the aft. Hmm. Peter, the lighting on that reminds me of some of the haunting photographs that have come out of Ukraine in the last week. Oh. Um, absolutely heartrending, but. Yes. Um, it's, it's wonderful lighting on that, isn't it? It is, yes. I was trying to avoid, uh, uh, forget all about Ukraine for the moment. <laughs> yes, I, I agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> I don't mind. Right, behaviour. All you need is love by Pekka Turia from Finland. And uh, well, there you are. Two wow. Mortal embrace. <laughs> or is it three? Three, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, and this love pond is 20 minute drive from my home in Finland and has rewarded me plentifully over the past 10 years. <laughs> uh, April, late April last year, yes. And four days and nights wearing a dry suit, lots of underwear garments and a heated vest to survive the five degree sea water. Uh, yes, there they are. And then Rapunzel on fire by this is a uh, Bit of a made up picture, I think. Um, yeah. what this is all about. Composite. Rapunzel's got the hair, isn't she? That's the story of Rapunzel. <clears throat> yeah. I can think of black silhouette in the foreground, but at the same time, eye contact with the viewer. I can't understand why there's two, two sets of eyes. Mm. Anyway, mm. so the, yes, anyway, that's that one. Black and white. Sarah's underwater world. What's the thought? That must be underwater as well, mustn't it? Because it's an underwater series of pictures. So and is the, is the water surface of the water on that one immediately before this, across the middle? You're seeing the reflection in the top and the reel in the bottom. Because she's got lips, that woman, as well. Oh, uh, yes. You mean it's a ref it could be, I suppose. Yes, I, I know it's curious isn't it anyway um i'll move on i think now, this is another australian one um sarah's underwater world yes gosh having your eyes wide open underwater is always a bit of a problem i reckon for me can you all open your eyes underwater yes uh, <laughs> yeah. quite And she did it with one breath underwater. Yes, the therapeutic power of water. 
Let's see how many experienced during the pandemic. Hmm. Okay, no structures of Sarah and allowed her to, for the scene to evolve naturally. Uh, it's a pretty good portrait, considering. Yeah. I mean, it's a Rembrandt lighting. Look at that nose shadow. Very good. And the hair isn't in front of her in many ways. Yes, that came out very well. Compact piece by Enrico, somebody or other. Um, what? Compact piece. It's again wow. too big to fit on the screen. Oh. Ah. Just shrinking the picture a bit. Still too big. <laughs> oh well. You can see. You can have a look at these yourself later on. Yeah. This one is called Up and Coming Supernova. Supernova in Paradise. Well, not supposed to be underwater, is it? Yes. There's the surface there. And there's the sky. Right. Well. So how do they do that? Uh, I first met oh. Jan Nia having breakfast, one of my favourite food spots in Thailand. Um, she was wearing a stunning long white dress and we planned to shoot mostly the split shots with the sun set using strobes to illuminate the underwater sea. It's a pretty challenging shot since they didn't have any fins or wetsuit. Mm. What I like about the was the imperfection, the imperfection of backscatter recreating space and making it look perfect to me. Mm. You can understand that. Strange, strange, very strange. Um, this was a gannet from somebody in the UK. Oh, wow. yeah. That's pretty sharp, that bit there, when you, when you enlarge it. Yeah. Oops. Shift that, oh, where's he gone? You didn't seem to enlarge it, did you? There you are. Pretty sharp, that eye. So, how did you do that? Um, swim in an artistic hail of bubbles. Hitting the frigid water faster than an Olympic diver, these incredible birds had evolved air sacs in the head and chest to survive these repeated heavy impacts. So, uh, underwater, the sound was thunderous. Hmm. Sorry, yes, sorry. He got a different picture, that's the point. Uh, this was Water Mac, Best Buddies macro photograph. So, again, it's too big to fit on the screen. <laughs> oh, I'm good all, oh my god. You forget how, just how big some of these pictures are. <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it, not to see it. I don't know how big these things are. It, doesn't, it just says macro at the top, doesn't it? So, um, it says on here, we are diving in an area, we were diving in an area of reef, reef near Loch Caron in Rossshire. <coughs> Next afternoon, I did squeal and waving my torch in my, in my direction, I dropped down to see my buddy had found not only one, but two beautiful little Yarrells Blennies holed up in a crack. So there you go. Um, I'll enlarge it now again. <laughs> And this was a peaceful coexistence. Oh, yes, I see. Hmm. <laughs> Be nice standing oh. on there with that right underneath you. I wonder if, what the distance between horizontal distances between these two objects are. Uh, yes. I hope my image can inspire others to appreciate the wonders found right in our backyards. Hmm. Another one by Martin Strockpool. So that's probably another split image. Yes. Cool. Yes, it's good, isn't it? Uh, uh, living in shallow water for deep water, reaching impressive sizes, spiny starfish are abundant in Cornwall. Hmm. Uh, I, I catch a fish eye and was lucky to, with bright conditions. After a while, I came across a large. In a gully with exposed kelp. Exposed he used kelp. a fisheye lens. Yes, yes, he did. Uh, and I, this isn't kelp, is it? Oh, what's he talking about? Kelp. Oh, here's some kelp up here. Oh, all around here, the kelp. Yes, I see. Yes. That's what oh. we talk about. Yes. Hmm, interesting. 
that's that one. Uh, save our seas. Um, big appetite. Ah, oh, this is fishing. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, humans yeah. fishing. Yes. So that was an aerial perspective. Uh, <clears throat> Salted anchovy, anchovy, the most important straw material to create traditional Vietnamese fish sauce. Hmm. When they are overfished, the whales, tuna, seabirds, and other marine predators that rely on them face starvation and population decline. Hmm. Yes, right. Oh, that's it. Well, at the bottom, there are more links to other pictures here uh, that sound pretty good, some of them. Yeah. But we'll, look, we'll, we'll move on, I think, to another, another uh, link we've got here. A new scientist this week, the underwater photography, oh, yeah. uh, of Italy. They've got a, an under, a Nemo's garden and they're trying to grow things under, underwater in this Nemo's garden. And there's pictures of, of it in uh, a new scientist. They're pretty good too. You want the your things to eat, you mean? Yeah, yeah. That's it's what only... I was saying, the new scientist is yeah. coming up with some really good things. I always used to get those out for the kids at school and put put them up. Some of them are amazing, aren't they? Really amazing mm. photograph. But this one's about Nemo's garden in Italy this oh, no. week. Yeah, OK, thank you. I'll go to the library, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this this article is amusing. First ever recording of a dying human brain reveals dreaming like activity. Um, so there's a nice picture to illustrate it. Um, I've recorded the activity of a dying human brain for the first time. Uh, my whole life flashed before my eyes in a phrase that wasn't here, and there just might be something truth to it. <clears throat> Revealing the you know, first time with dying brain, revealing brain wave patterns related to processes like dreaming and memory of recall. So, um, I think there's an ad word there. Um, the study wasn't specifically designed to measure brain activity at the random time, unless it just happens uh, it just happens at the right time. Monitoring the brains of an 87 year old epilepsy patient using EEG to watch for seizures. However, the patient suddenly had a heart attack and died. As such, the researchers managed to record 15 minutes of brain activity around that time. We focused on the 30 seconds either side of when the heart stopped and detected increased activity in brain waves known oh. as gamma oscillations. These are involved in processes such as dreaming, meditation, and memorial retrie memory retrieval, giving a glimpse into what a person may be experiencing in their final moments. Goodness me. Uh, through generating oscillations involving, involved in memory retrieval, the brain may be playing the last recall of important life events just before we die. Well, maybe. Um, wow. uh, I haven't died yet, so I wouldn't know. No, this is the problem. <laughs> Very tricky, isn't it? <laughs> the brain observes that the brain is capable of coordinating its activities even after the blood stops flowing through it. Similar changes in gamma waves around the time of death had previously indicated in detected in rats, but this marks the first time that it's been detected in humans. Of course, the results should be taken with some caution, <laughs> of course. Um, the data comes from just a single case, and even then it was a patient whose brain had been injured and was undergoing unusual activity related to epilepsy. Yes. Tricky to wow. time that recording, isn't it? That's the thing. Mm. So there you are, the Frontiers of Aging Neuroscience, that was. I don't know, I'm a bit weird. That weird. Um, I expect they're all in the New Scientist, all these things. Yeah. Um, oh, what's happened here? Uh, go away. What's all this? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, there's a, more, more photography ones. Um, the 2022 Sony World, World Events. I thought that was... <laughs> That's a good start, that picture, I thought. This is actually an old road sign, judging by all the, um, the paint peeling and so forth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not true, is it? Well, the painting was with a clean climate. Uh, See how it was. <laughs> the sign reads, I must remember not to do anything that is against the law of the earth. What sign? I can't see a sign. It's already been done. 
Anyway, uh, that's the sort of thing you find in America when you're just driving along in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I think uh, if I go to the top, I can. Um, where's it gone? But I can click the click here and get the images one after the other. Where are we now? Um, oh, it's so go sideways. Yes. So if we go to the left one, yes, we just we didn't quite see that one. Whatever it is. Um, as the adverts on the right. Oh, I can get rid of those, perhaps. Oh, sort of. <coughs> <coughs> An uninhabitable volcanic desert <coughs> in the Atlantic Highlands. <coughs> Beach tree in autumn. Uh -huh. Wil in, in Wiltshire. How about that? Oh yeah, um, that, that must be our last one. <laughs> um, this one was. Council actually, haven't got to that one yet. Singapore. <laughs> no, well, I've got these funny trees. They've got their. Um, yes, it's just pretty. Um, duty of volunteer during COVID nineteen. Really. Hmm. Fox between the trees. Oh yeah. Killing the fox. Okay. Um, that one is a bit strange. Lithuania. Um, uh, oh, yeah. I can't really see what that is. I'll move on. Oh, yeah, another one of those. That's in Japan, I suppose. Oh, no, it says Northern Iran. Damavan oh, Mountain. I see. I thought it was two. In Iran, oh. the highest volcano in Asia. In the past, the slopes of the mountain were covered with a unique anemone known as La Marina. In recent years, global warming, low snowfall, and air pollution have affected the greenery of this region and led to drought, meaning it all died out. Um, this was. Uh, out of crude oil refinery. Yes, it emits large volumes of, of toxic fumes, mercury, benzene, chromium, sulfuric acid, and dioxine. Ranks 233rd on the list of greenhouse gas producers. So that's, high, so that's a nasty thing, that, whatever it is. It doesn't say where it is, does it? Yeah. He came from the United States of America, so possibly it was there. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. This is a, a picture of a tower. It's quite striking. Wow. X marks the spot. This was, uh, yes, uh, more whales. Um, <laughs> it's just two whales. <laughs> yes, a few seconds and it's over. That's what you can find in Northern Ireland, you see. Right. And this was a. Is it a landscape? It looks like a something like that. Oh, toxic, toxic waste. waste. Copper mine, yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. The things we do as humans. Oh. Yes. Uh, move on, I think it's horrible. Oh, there's that one again. Um, uh. Chaha Mahal, wherever all that is. And uh, there's the oh, cycling and learn. What that is? Tehran. Wow. Amazing. Tehran. Oh, yeah. The hazardous place to cycle, doesn't it? Yeah. The top of a building, oh, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it looks like a, uh, an arena, doesn't it? It's, well, this, I don't know what this in front is. Presumably you could easily slap down the there, there, couldn't you? Strange. Okay. You know, a little cloud above it. Yes. And this was a football fans of the Bohemians play at Prague. Bohemians Prague, 1905 team. What? Thank their fans for a match against. Why oh, 1905? Oh, I saw that. some good cameras back in 1905. Yes, <laughs> it's very good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, cool. um, this is Latvia. So why did they leave that little hole there? Is it, is it a pond? Well, is this pond in the middle of it, I should think, isn't it? Yes. Is it lavender around it? Yeah. Anyway, quite a nice photograph. Yeah, 
an urban fox on a windshield, I see. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Well, that one's more interesting, a cave. Cool, uh, yeah. Speleothems. Do you think these are speleotherms? Hmm. Um, underwater scooter. Mexico. Yes. Hmm. Again, it's nicely lit from behind there, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. And that okay. is a green-eyed carpenter bee holding a small crystal. Mm, mm, mm. I reckon oh, I'm set up. up. And that one is uh, an object of the, has brought the viewer's imagination to another world that exists outside of time. And in doing so doing to invoke conversation around themes of futurism amid the darker side of human ideals. All of these images are taken in 2021 in Iceland during the pandemic. Well, yes, I don't understand that. Seahorse. Um, 125 well, images were stacked yeah. together to create this image using glycerine as the background medium and backlit with an LED. Why do you want 125 images? That must mm -hmm. be a very good quality image if you blew it up properly. I'm yeah. ready to get it in focus. Are these fo focus stack that wouldn't appear? Well, perhaps so. But I but if, to... it's, if it's the th thickness of the thing. Yes, yeah, you know, there's an exhibition in the museum on uh, uh, Iron Age Hillforts, photographs from above by d drone. I don't know whether you've been there, but um, some of the big ones sort of uh, a metre high at least, were taken with lots of photographs stitched together, like this one. Yeah. And, and you can't see the joins in any of them. And what it means is that those images can, even though taken from a drone, which is fairly low resolution, I suppose, he was able to um, get huge enlargements if you want, if you want big poster-sized ones. Uh, and we, we had the, the chap that did all those photographs came to the museum yesterday and had a, a, a talk. So I attended that talk. Right, uh, it's the sort of thing that Photoshop does for you anyway, though, isn't it? Well, yes, he used Photoshop or something like it. Yes. Um, blueprints. Ah, this is a process created in cyan cyanotype. Using oh, cyanotype, yeah. Well, it's a you digital. It's at, Tot at Totten College, this cyanotype. Yeah, well, making uh, weird images. Well, this is this is digital. I only don't, don't think it was real. Um, using digital. Yeah, we used to use real one. Yeah, mm. made a rough mess. It did. I used to do those in the that in the past. Um, yeah, but it gets everywhere, doesn't it? I mean, stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, all engineering drawings were cyanotypes, of course, in the in yeah. the old days. They were originally. Yeah. Or blueprints for some reason. Blueprint, um, <laughs> yeah. There was another one there. Hunting, That's the underwater one. Uh, sea lion hunting. Which way is oh, wow. oh, So that's the head. That's the tail, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> the fish. Sardines, poor things. Uh, on these, on that's Nemo's garden. That's the one that's in New Scientist. Oh, this, right. this week. That's Nemo's oh. garden. Oh, in, right. in, in Italy. And uh, yeah, yeah. We are. They were perhaps to draw a necessary source of light for development. So it's, it's like uh, <laughs> hydro, hydroponic, definitely right. hydroponic. Yeah, they're growing stuff in this, in this garden. <laughs> Fancy it being here, yeah. off the Noli Shore, a small village on the Ligurian coast. Mm -hmm. coast yeah. there, there was a programme on telly about that a few weeks ago, wasn't there? Was there? Yeah. yeah. Well, hmm. Have to hunt around for that sort of thing. Measuring time. That's a 12 meter stalactite formed in the dry cavern millions of years ago. How can it be dry? Um, it stopped growing 8,000 years ago when the cave flooded. Oh, I see. And so it's all water here, yes. Yes. Ah, Australian one. Oh. Can you believe it? There you are. <laughs> there you are, Diana. That's what you've got in Australia somewhere. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that. <laughs> no, probably not. 
uh, red beds. Oh, the red bed, yeah. Himalayan orogeny. Orogeny? Orogeny. Orogeny. Yeah, yeah, the main red stuff. So. Have you come across that word, uh, Diana? Yeah. Orogeny oh. uh, means hills, uh, yeah. mountains. Oh, well, thank you for telling me. Yeah, didn't really know that. Still. So, anyway, um, that's this curious uh, shape, so I have to say. Oh. <clears throat> the um, the front cover of the digital uh, RPS Digital Group magazine has got a picture of some rocks in Northumbria. Absolutely superb picture it was. Anyway, I can't show you that at the moment. Um, Dorf, Dorf, <laughs> a photo montage of a photo montage really? of a village house and local forest. Plants taken in the Croatian agricultural region of Slavonia. Oh, yeah. This was part of a broader story about the mass exodus of people from the region. The photo montage created in 2021 and its parts were shot in 2020 and 2021. What a weird thing. Oh. It makes quite a nice composition. It does. Sure. Oh, that must be. A radio aerial, isn't it? A direction, must be directional of some sort, doesn't it? Any opinion there, Richard? No, no. no well, as you say, yeah. it looks like a radio aerial of some description. Mm. The end of a runway, I expect, is a true snow. Ah, it could be, yes. Well, it could be just a big clothes hanger. Uh, it could be. <laughs> we've got to the end, yes. Right, good. Um, how do we get out of this? Right, we'll move on to the next one immediately. <laughs> yeah. That takes a while for it to come up. Yes. Um, oh, this was fascinating. Um, you see at the top, focused ultrasound foundation. It was talking about, uh, well, there's stuff on top of it, is there? Um, focused ultrasound is an, in an early stage in non invasive therapeutic technology with the potential to improve the quality of life and decrease the cost of care for patients with Alzheimer's disease, which my wife has now in her advanced stages of it. So it's too late for her. Um, but what, what it is, the beam, where the beams converge, focused ultrasonic sound produces several therapeutic effects without incisions or radiation. One mechanism is the temporary opening of the blood-brain barrier which may aid the removal of beta amyloid uh, plaques, those plaques. I don't know what TEO means from the brain. Um, uh, then when, it's, when the brain, uh, blood brain barrier is open, you then can apply drugs specifically to those particular plaques to wow. just plaques. I think that's what it was meant to do. Um, so then I Peter, it's called focused ultrasound. How, how small an area are they treating there? Well, I don't know. I, haven't, uh, I, don't, I couldn't tell you here. Um, what I can tell you is that they have started trials on humans in Australia, probably in Britain as well, but I don't know about that. I only know it's in Australia because my daughter told me that she knew about this and she said, oh, yes, yes, yes. oh, yeah, we're doing it down in Sydney or somewhere. Um, so... Uh, Perhaps some diner can find out more for me. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anything about it, actually. But I can have a look. <laughs> it's just a thought. I don't have to do it. Um, Neuromodulation use of selected targets in put yes. Promising preclinical trials studies of da, 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 enhances the delivery of therapeutic drugs, that's it, and antibodies. Focused ultrasound in combination with micro bubbles can safely open the BBB the blood-brain barrier, and enable enhanced delivery of anti-amyloid antibodies to the brain. Uh, yes, it sounds all very good to me. Yeah. Well, it's so difficult to cure this particular disease. Um, so here's the non-invasive, no incisions, it's precise targeting. Um, treatment can be complementary to th drug therapy. So, yes. They're doing it in Toronto, I see, yeah. uh, and in the US, uh, didn't mention Australia or anything like that. So, yes, it could, we could easily find out a bit more, I reckon, if we 
comes into some of these areas. Queensland University. We could click this one here, clinic, list of clinical trial sites. Ah, I, haven't looked, I haven't looked at that. Queensland. Um, where are they? It's a pretty blank screen for me. Oops, what's happened? Um, screen before, did it actually mention Australia? Yeah, Queensland University, wasn't it? Japan, Japan, oh, blind, look at them all. Bielefeld in Germany, Jesus. Oh my God, um, yes. Jesus. Busy, busy. It's a, this is not all for, not all for, um, Basing Stoke. Yes, I know. I think this is all for uh, Alzheimer's because it talks about set the disease. We haven't done that, you see. So we put. Oh, I uh, see. Yeah. Do, do that. Then I didn't realise you we got to do that. Yeah. So that's one term. Then we do. We could do it for say um, Australia. Be at the top of the page, you see. <laughs> um, do you need a search term, a disease term? I don't know. Anyway. It says USA on the right, look. Yeah. Yeah, but you got USA on the right of that column that you were looking at. Oh, here we are. Yes, there's a tick in this column here. So... Next one out. Well, have I done it right or wrong? Didn't you have said search? Well, I've done that, yes. Um, I'll go back. Oh. To... I can't go back, can I? Yeah, the, 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 the grade eight one. Search by state, US of... Yeah, well, that's the USA. We don't want that, do we? No, uh, but have you actually kill that off, or is it already killed off? It's, it's got uh, no... Search by disease, all countries. Uh, showing a... Anyway, uh, treatment site. Sort by site name. Sort by... Oops. Commercial treatment. Sort by clinical trial. Sort by city. Sort by country. Ah, perhaps you would do that. Country. Get there in the end. Oh, yeah. There's only two in Australia. One in Melbourne and one in Sydney. One in London. Yeah, uh, what? One in London, the bottom one. Oh, that says Canada, though. Oh, uh, it's Canada. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, yes, you're right. Well, if we go right down to Scotland. Oh, so the <laughs> to get to Great Britain is quite difficult, isn't it? By number ten, <laughs> uh, United Kingdom comes before that, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I better go to nine. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, by seven instead. Seven, yeah. Never again. The Russian Federation. That's the one I didn't have. It must be eight. <laughs> ah, here we go, yes. Oh, quite a lot in the UK. Yeah, yeah. 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 Stuff, yeah. London, London, Dundee, Birmingham, Imperial London, College. Springfield, Stockport, Guildford, Dorchester. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I'm quite amazed. Dorchester. Oh, we can go to, go to Winter, Winterbourne Hospital in Dorchester. It's not that far away. Near the oh. Tesco Superstore. <laughs> oh, it's prostate cancer. It, it, it doesn't do it right, does it? Uh, let's move across. Let's move on. That's our next one, I think. Um, you, this is one that was sent to me by a certain Australian, I think. <laughs> this one? Yeah, that looks familiar. Yeah. Yes, Diana sent me the two video, two um, links. Both are amazing things you can find in science. Um, uh, and that was, what, what you, yes, this, this is number two. Yes, humans can dissolve razor blades. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, Acid yeah. in the stomach is, is between one and two in the pH scale, which is very yeah, close to yeah, yeah. absolutely horrible. <laughs> I'll say these just razor blade swallowers managed to do it. Is it you just swallow <laughs> and let it eat away? Yeah, well, um, yes, people eat cars and things, don't they, as well. Um, this one was a laser can get trapped in water. Well, it just bounces around in, in the total internal reflection, I suppose. I think that's what it says. Uh, yes, total internal reflection. So 
it doesn't it might get trapped but if you switch off yeah. it doesn't take long to decay does it <laughs> it doesn't mm. go around forever and ever <laughs> um speaking of did you know your iphone can be hacked by with a laser pointer uh, so just be, just beware um uh, earth's oxygen is produced by the ocean well it's use, useful to know um, maybe by a rainforest but we thank the uh, thank plankton no it's a plant-based marine organisms for all that fresh air plankton seaweed and other photosynthesizers produce more than half the world's oxygen <coughs> so there you go um and the next one was earth magnetic field orientation by used by people like critters like that um or did the u.s geological survey so <clears throat> Do birds use that? No, yeah. Yeah, they've got a little compass, a little magnetic compass at them, isn't it? Uh, There's a, an iron, little iron thing in the head, isn't there, something? Yes, something, something like that, yes. I, mean, I, like I guess a... you can click on here and go to another link and look at that for a moment. Wow. Uh, yes, oh, I see. <laughs> Felines and can canines are colorblind. Yes, we knew that. Oh, they are. Huh? Miss bees, miss bees, what? Well, miss bees can sting only once. Oh, so no, no, maybe they can sing twice. Um, Depends what <laughs> type they are, isn't it? Anyway, we were on this one. I think was it to this one here. Um, a cloud can weigh a million pounds. So I asked what wow. I asked um, Alexa what a million pounds is in proper sort of weight <laughs> and said it's about 500 tons so when it was reduced to 500 tons it doesn't sound anywhere near as, as dramatic as a million pounds yeah. <laughs> typical American. It's, um, that's, it looks like an American article yeah yes exactly I said it's typically American the way they do yeah, that yes yeah, yeah. So the American the geological service yeah. yeah. Uh, just one teaspoon of soil, there are more microorganisms yeah. than people on the planet. Millions of species and billions of organisms. Um, yeah. So well, I think we know that, don't we? Yeah. Um, ignore that. Wow. Rats laugh when they're tickled. Yes, I think we know that as well, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> that's good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a pet rat, that's what you do, you tickle them. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that next time I catch one. <laughs> Bananas are radioactive. Yes, I think we knew that as well, didn't we? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Because of the potassium. Yeah. Potassium yeah. forty. I used to use that in the uh, uh, school science classes. I used to put <laughs> banana there, and uh, and we detect the banana, detect the potassium in the banana. They were worried about um, stuff being brought in on banana boats. Uh, uranium, uranium waste and things for dirty bombs. So they put detectors in the in the ships for uh, radiation. Disguise them, you mean? Because it would have masked. Well, it would have masked it. So you yes, use a Geiger is. counter to measure the radiation. Yeah, they put Geiger counters in the ships because they, they, if they put the uh, uranium waste in there for dirty bombs and God knows what, the bananas would have masked the radiation. So they had to, they had to put these radiation detectors in. Well, they were. I don't know what when they put them in. Whether they're loading and unloading, perhaps, or something. You know. I don't know whether I could actually eat ten million bananas to find out whether I was going to die or not. But they, yeah, yeah, you're glowing the dark. Yeah, <laughs> forget it, Richard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is faster than cold water. Yes, we've come across that, and that is true. I didn't know. I didn't know it's called the whatever that's pronounced. Oh yeah, it's throw it up in the air, don't you? Or something. Like How do you yeah. pronounce that word? M P E M. Impemba. 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 Say it again. Impemba. Impemba. Right. Okay. M is a separate letter, yeah. really. Yes. Want to put an e in front of it then? Make it easy. Because they're not English. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> He was an African, wasn't he? You just only we wait, only we wasted, we, we wasted of an E, wasn't it? Well, it was a person, well, it doesn't say that, does it? Just, well, just, just... 
the effect. Yeah, isn't he the guy who, who, who um, proved that effect? Oh, that yeah. water freezes uh, quicker than cold water. Because it, it was on Radio 4, they, they did an experiment. In the winter, if you poured boiling kettle water on your bird's bath, it freezes quicker. Yes, I know yeah. that. Just wondering. I was wondering who Mapemba was. It didn't say who, who, who it was. Um, Pentium here, look. And there's the proof. Um, didn't say who found it. Yeah, uh, there's his name, uh, further up. Go back just up. Back, just back a bit. Oh, oh there we are. Yeah. Rasto Bartholomew Mapemba. Rasto Bartholomew Mapemba. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Clever lad. Sorry? Yeah. The next one is, where was that? That was, um, yes, that was that one. And then we did another. Oh, yeah. Yes, this is the second. This is the second one that um, Diana sent me. 17 quick science facts. And yeah. one of them I noticed disagreed with the other one, which I thought was interesting. Um, there's enough DNA in your average person to stretch from the sun to Pluto and back. 17 times, times, which is a no, and Pluto's a long way away, isn't it? Hell yeah, that's the end of the universe, um, end of the solar system. Tells you here, two, two, the, ten, two times 10 to the 14 meters. Sounds doesn't sound much, does it? <laughs> 37 trillion cells in the human body, yes. Wow. Yes, and then the, the next one, human body carries 10, to, uh, 10 times more bacterial cells than humans. Yeah. This is what this is, is where it disagrees with the previous one. Did you notice that, Diana? Um, okay. I didn't actually read them all in detail. Well, you see, this says, that, um, yes, the bacteria in the human are 10 times more than the bacterial cells. If you go back to this one and find the same, same item uh, down here, um get to it. It shows you how thoroughly I studied your um <laughs> uh, where the hell is it? <laughs> I don't think that's the same lot. Isn't it? Oh. No. Oh, should it be that one then? Ah, yes, got the wrong one. Yes. Okay, scrolling down to that one. Uh human genome. No, not that one. I don't think it's that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. It's water in three states, helium. It's impossible to burp in space. Plastics can end up as the vanilla flavouring, just as a matter of passing interest. Um, ah, yeah. here we are. This is the one. Uh, experts uh, estimate the human body consists of 39 trillion, slightly different number. Um, but it also says that the ratio is 1 to 1.3. And it says researchers thought we were much more bacteria than human with a ratio of 10 to 1. So you see, this the article is possibly a later version, if you like, than the, 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 this other one where it, where it talks about 10 times. Uh, somebody so else was counting. We, how much on this article, this, this page, do we believe now? <laughs> I don't think the person who counted them had enough fingers. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. His abacus. He broke his abacus. Took a photo. Yeah, I thought this article, whether, whether there's any truth in this, I don't know. It takes a photo and up to 40,000 years to travel from the core of the sun to its surface, and only eight minutes to travel to the Earth. How can it take yeah. 40,000 years to get to the surface of the sun? Yeah, that's been around, that story's been around a couple of months now. Yes. Is there any it's truth in it? Due to the high, extreme high gravity, is it, of the, the centre yeah. of the sun? High um, density of gravity, yeah. I don't know, does it say it okay. scatters? Is the sun solid, though? Does it not rotate internally, like the Earth? I expect it does, yes. Well, it certainly will. Which may mean that's why it takes such a long time to get out. Going around in circles. <laughs> How many minutes 40,000 years is compared to eight minutes? I mean, the ratio is enormous. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and here we are with the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I assume you've been there, Diana. Um, I've been to bits of it. Well, you've been to it then, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. I don't expect you to visit all of it. <laughs> um, I'd yeah. like to go again. Yes. Yeah, amazing. The yellow submarine, is it? You go underwater as well to see it. Um, yeah, I did. I went in a special submarine type thing to look underneath the water. Yeah, yes. yellow submarine, wasn't it? Yeah, a yellow submarine. A yellow submarine, yeah. Who <laughs> great one. that? The bloke feeds the fish, doesn't he? Feeds the groupers from it. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Anyway, Wacky right. things, mm -hmm. aren't they? <laughs> so there's lots more facts here that we, you oh, know, yeah. look at. I'm not quite sure this is an adverse, I think. Uh, Actually, two dozen states of matter that we know of. Hmm. Two dozen. That's 12, isn't it? That's about that's just like the number of states of the conditions of, of ice, water. How many states of water are there besides ice oh. and, and liquid and gas? There were lots, weren't there? There's about 17, is it, states of ice? Killer whales are actually dolphins. Are they really? Yeah. Grasshoppers oh, okay. have ears and their bellies. Things like that. You can't taste food without saliva. It might be true, yes. When yeah. helium is cooled to absolute zero, it becomes a liquid with uh, flows up against gravity. It starts running up over the lip of the glass container. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As this little picture shows, I suppose. Yeah. How weird. Um, the Beetlejuice exploded it would light our sky continually for two months at any time. It's only 430 light years away. Yes. Uh, octopuses have three hearts and nine brains and blue blood. <laughs> very royal, very royal, yes. I thought yeah. this was strange. An individual blood cell takes about 60 seconds to make the complete circuit of the human body. And that's just incredible if that's true um five liters of blood around your heart oh what's that what was that noise about are we so am i still sharing yeah yes. yeah right yeah. so 50 million 50 000 million galaxies galaxies Took me a long while to remember how to pronounce that. Then it got to the next line, which is a hundred thousand million, and then a thousand thousand million, or a million million. It's hard to get your tongue around some of these numbers. How do you get a camera far enough away to photograph it like that? Though? Well, it's like the, the chap said last night when he was photographing these Iron oh. Age hill forts. You can only, uh, with a drone, you're not allowed to go above 400 feet, I think it was, or 400 meters. Um, yeah. And the, the camera lenses aren't wide enough, even though they're wide angle, they're not wide enough angle to get the whole of the Iron Age hill fort in. So he, that's when he decided to take several pictures and stitch them together. That's what they've done there, you see. <laughs> I'm not quite sure you get far enough away to see whatever it is, 100, 100 million uh, stars in the first place. Well, I was. I thought the problem was getting near enough, not far near enough. enough. Yeah. <laughs> Hot water freezes cars and, uh, yes, uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, so, so there's a whole lot of stuff there and I've got lots more to show yet and it's already 11.20. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it's my bedtime, so I'm going to go now. Thank you. All right, I go, Diana. Nice to hear from you. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Diana. Here, Diana. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 <laughs> right. Uh, yes, this was a peculiar one. Um, they put these little beads with presumably drugs in into mice with tumours and they let, let the mice walk around. And after a week, the, the tumours have gone. Good God. Um, wow. Which I think is quite a clever technique. Yeah. Um, 100% of tumours in mice in the space of a week. 
So that was okay. extraordinary. Um, a promising new form of immuno immunotherapy. Hmm. <coughs> That's a yes, a, in effect. So Once it's in place, it generates the compounds needed to take out the tumors all on its own. Good grief. Hmm. Of a pinhead beads. Yes, these beads are engineered to produce a natural compound called interleukin 2 and cytokine that produce, causes white blood cells to spring into action. Aha! These beads were first put to the test in laboratory <coughs> experiments. Da, 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 da. The drug factors were shown to be selective, selective to generate concentrations <coughs> to within the tumors with little seen elsewhere. And you must admit that's quite an ingenious system, isn't it? It is. That's fantastic if that works. Yeah. Oh, wow. Experiments on ovarian cancer and colorectal cancer. Again, performed exceptionally well, eradicating tuners and little rodents in as little as six days. Stuff. That's just amazing. Did it say what's in the beads? <laughs> yes. <coughs> I missed that. Uh, right, go back to where it says inside the beads there's a natural compound called interleukin 2. Yeah, kills it. This is the natural compound, okay? Uh, it's a cytokine and it causes the white blood cells to spring into action. That's the point. Oh, wow. I guess they're normally banned inside of cancer from getting into the cancer somehow. Mm -hmm. There's a, a blood a brain, a BVB, I expect. <laughs> Uh, so we just administer once, but the drug factors keep making the dose every day uh, where it's needed until the cancer is eliminated. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> yeah. We're able to eradicate tumors 100% in seven of eight animals with colorectal cancer. The protective shell plays an important part in the, in the bead, the protective shell in the function of the drug factories, not just in keeping their content safe. This casing is made of materials that the immune system recognizes as foreign, but only as a threat that needs to be dealt with after a certain period of time, ensuring that treatment doesn't continue indefinitely. Well, you see how ingenious that is. Sure, yeah. We found foreign bodies reactions safely and robustly turned off the flow of cytokine from the capsules within 30 days. Well, there you go. There they are. Where is this in production? It's not, this is ex very experimental, is it? Yes, it says the Rice University there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, let's have a look. Um, this hasn't got into manufacturing yet, obviously. Then, really, well, later, human clinical trials. It's American, yeah. Later this year, yeah. yes. Federal drug that's, that's very yeah, ingenious, I think. That's very ingenious. Right, I'll move on to the next one. The battery, it's, this infinity train I thought was brilliant. <laughs> this is, um, uh, what's the word? Um, when you have a machine that goes on forever. In, uh, what's the word? I oh, can't think of it. motion. Yeah, uh, yes, exactly. That's what they're trying to imply here, you see. All so basically, right. you have a train <clears throat> bringing uh, iron ore from the hills in Australia. And it runs down various slopes to charge up batteries and things um, without using the, an engine, just charging up the batteries. <coughs> and then when it returns, being empty, it has less weight. <coughs> and there's enough charge in the battery to get back up to the mine. So Got to be some losses around. though, aren't there? Got to be losses. Right. Well, yeah, I know, I know. But the, the, just... the losses are, are not outweighed. It's got enough battery charge to get back up, according to them. Um, you can read Australian Fortescue Company. <coughs> I think that's done in several places throughout the world, not just uh, in Australia. Well, this, this is one where you don't need to ever charge it. That's the point. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. But it's not only in Australia, it's done in many places, even in this country. In but it doesn't mention that at oh, all. Um, 
will remove the need for interest in renewable energy generation and recharging structure and make it capital efficient. So essentially, while details are scant, it seems what's happening is that um, the team calculated there's enough downhill slope and braking opportunities in the loaded direction to charge the batteries regeneratively and the train is so much lighter when unloaded, the battery can take it all the way back to the start without needing a charge. This sounds reasonable. Ken? <laughs> I don't know, it doesn't sound right that so. <laughs> So uh, we'd have done that years ago. Topological parameters are correct for it to work, so it won't work everywhere. No. And it says it will work in wetter, lower friction areas than Western Australia, where they're doing. All oh, right, certain areas, yeah. Bloody hell, that's really good. Yeah, yeah I thought was, I, I thought this company they were talking about world's first ammonia power chip, the same company doing that. So that's worth exploring as well. <clears throat> the world is endless, this thing. Um, and then this one I thought was getting uh, drinking water out of thin air, so to speak, using something called a uh, salty hydro gel. Sorry? Uh, that was a um, Dera invented that, those gels. Who did? Dera, Defence Research Agency. Oh, right. <laughs> invented these hydrogels. I see. And there's, there's probably no weight in them. It's, they're just like, yeah, incredible. Yeah. Huge <laughs> surface area. Yes, yes, I can imagine this. Yes. You were going to do something with I can't remember what they were doing. I think they, they wrap them around explosives or something uh, to stop them. To... to yeah, I think when they were recovering stuff, they, they wrap, put the hydrogel, put them in, in the hydrogels, and it made them safe. I can't remember something like that. But yeah, Derrida invented that hydrogel thing. Here's what he says: hydrogels are mostly made of water. That doesn't stop them wanting more. Their excellent absorbency makes them useful in diaper bandages and do dehumidifiers and extract drinking water from the air. And that. Um, is a slow but in and inefficient, it says. But adding hygroscopic salts um, it, uh, yeah, it speeds it up, of course. <clears throat> it says they don't, they don't, uh, frustratingly, they don't integrate with the hydrogels. So a new study set out to a way of mixing the two together. And they came across this lovely word, Zwitterionic. <laughs> that must be made up. No, it's a sweater, a sweater iron. Yeah, well, it's got negative and positive. Yeah, that's act. Yeah, it's a, it's a well-known word. I never heard of it before. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, no, it's just yeah, it's just a standard thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely word. It's Swiss Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Probably was German. It, was it a Swiss? It must have been a Swiss. Well, it could have been German. It's probably German. Yeah, could have been. Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> So it contains both ions, positive and negative ions, which is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so they put that with it, and um, it enables you to absorb uh, moisture out of the air, just dry air, effectively. Straight to iron, yeah. It says salty hydrogel worked extremely well. The team was able to extract five, one and a half gallons mm -hmm. of water per kilogram of material per day from the air with a humidity of 30%. Yes, well, that's a nice number, isn't it? <coughs> it means much. Um, so I think that was all on that one. Yeah, so there you are. Way to get water out of the desert when we're in the desert. Just need a Zwitteronic thing. Ah, this is about the, the life of pie, the 10 years of the Raspberry Pi. The famous yeah. British invention, uh, University of Cambridge. There is the Pi computer. This is a, a fascinating article when you read it thoroughly. There's a lot, a very long article, um, and it's astonishing what's happened in the past 10 years. They've made 40 million for a start. All right. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of these Raspberry Pis. I bought them for Totten College. Uh, right. it, 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 they were really, really quite powerful little, little, little computers. I've got yes. them now. 
we might have found one, one lad managed to managed to work out how to fit it all together. It was quite difficult to 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 do, yes. but uh, it made a really really powerful little computer. Brilliant thing. Well, yeah, you Raspberry Pi. When you read through this article, Ken, you'll see that they've yeah. gone on producing. I think it's a, there's a Pi Five now or something like that. Yeah. A variety of it. Um, I've got I've got two I've got two of them here, but I couldn't uh, couldn't get out. Uh, and the patience to do it, but this lad did. He was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, all the all the profits were returned back to Pi Foundation and helped kids. Education. Yeah. They were trying to get students at Cambridge to learn how to do coding. Yes. They this Pi, and yeah. it's made a, a, at least a factor of eight times more students doing it now. Yeah. Than, than ten years ago. It was That's an age. Teaching coding, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's what all this area is about. Um, but it goes on um, a bit further than that. There was a massive decline in people applying. and sort of heartbreaking in a place like Cambridge. So they set about um, doing it. And, uh, and yeah. then grew up with the BBC Micro. That was good, wasn't it? It was very similar in a way. But that was a, quite a big lump. <laughs> um, so there were lots of conversations going on about that. Um, we went on and on and on. It, as I say, it's quite a long article. Um, and it's, as they fixed a price of $25, I suppose, um, the cost of a textbook. And it required to be robust. So they wanted children to own their own raspberry and put it in the school bag and take it, put it in and out lots of times. So this, they made it so that it was very robust, and they still work ten years later. These little yeah. Um Well, mine are still in boxes here. I, don't know. I could do yeah. it. Get them out, really, I could, I, and play around with them. You know. And it's the first uh, little low-cost one that will run like Linux, which I think was in. Did you try running Linux with your pies? I can't remember what we what we used. We uh, heck. They were using coding, uh, coding, which, which yeah. is the usual coding thing, the, the common one. Yes, yes. Yeah. Using C, C, C++ or something. Yeah, I think it was. C, one of the C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, the design was eventually realized with just three chips. The addition of a low-cost keyboard, a TV for display. It can act as a fully functional programmable computer. And it can be networked and used in groups for more advanced students or for industrial use. Introduced yeah. in 2012, it won the Index Award. The first Raspberry Pi was manufactured in China, but production rapidly moved to Wales, Pen Coed, also in 2012. So it was amazingly quick. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, we easily visit, they could easily visit the factory and understand what was going on. So it was much better to have it local. Um, oops. Uh, yeah, around Linux, that's right. The people who work in the factory mostly monitor and look after the machines. The automated, there's an automated approach to making these things um, with improved throughput and quality. We brought good paying jobs to the UK while still producing the low cost computer with an original concept. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I was saying, quite a long article, we still haven't got to the bottom. Oh, um, yeah. Set up as a non profit foundation uh, as it enters its second day in designing our own chips and microcontrollers. Um, part of a coalition that back in 2007 it was more like a voice in the wilderness. Yes, um, where's it gone about the computer Pi 5? Isn't it? I think I went, I went off to another link on one of these links to find out what was going on. Yes, I did buy one myself, Kenneth. Did you? Did you get a hang of it? I, I, you need to learn bits and pieces to go with it, didn't you? That was a, one of the problems. Yeah, I, did. I sent it to my son as a Christmas present. All right. Christmas before this last Christmas. And he's supposed to be doing things, but it's yeah. typical of my son. He's done nothing with it. I got oh, sent, right. him, sent him a proper keyboard to go with it and everything. Oh, yeah. Disappointed, but there we are. So that's what the children do. Uh, yeah, you need, they need to really concentrate on it, don't you? There's another link we've got to, yes. This is one yeah. where 
talked about the, the different versions of the pies. Um, uh, where the, the bits over there? Oh, I think I got the two. A plus and B plus can still be purchased. Hmm. The Pi 2 I've got not the biggest step change. I've got two, I think. And then the Pi 3 came in 2016. Uh, the new uh, one came out just recently as well. Yeah, I'm still talking about Pi. I'm going to go down to Pi 5, I think. Pi wow. 4 here, the latest model, it says. Um, but every product we launch is a milestone. Pi 4 is really is a milestone. There's another chunky three times performance, lacks memory constraint. We've opened up multiple price points for us thanks to memory configurations. And again, the jump in performance. I'm sure it talks about Pi 5 somewhere. They're running at half a million pies a month. Gosh. Hell fire. That's, that's not enough. It, it's not nothing. It's a lot of pies. I still think we have one or two million units of genuine customer backlog. So they're not up to speed, really. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, we've got problems with supply chains at the moment. All right. Yeah. Well, I've got these two. Might be worth a lot of money, eh? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> As you can see, more links to more more Pi things here. Uh, yeah, as five, future, yeah. The Raspberry Pi 5 is inevitable. But uh, in a yeah. blow to those hoping for something even more exotic, uh, in the usual usually Broadcom, ARM, SOC, RISC, V, internet isn't on the cards, certainly not from the time frame for the next generation, uh, whatever he's talking about there. Um, so it comes for NVIDIA, again, let's see that, and ARM, that's, that's a pretty good company, isn't it? Yeah. So, yes, it's um fascinating article, those two. It is. Right up your, right up your streets, Ken. Yeah, I know. It's interesting to see what's happened to it, you know, because it, it just was such a good idea. Because it was so cheap and you could get it into the school and the kids could sort of play around with it. And then they could learn coding and they could go, use Linux as well. And uh, yeah, it was brilliant. But it, it's like schools, you know, you've got to get them, get them interested. And <laughs> yes, I just got this one lad. Well, lad, it was enthused. But I have um, some applications already done beforehand to, to inspire them, I suppose. Yeah, probably. Should have had one, yeah. yeah. Right, and move on quickly to... Um, I found Svita. Svita is hermaphrodite. Oh, right, a yes. Svita, a Svita iron is hermaphrodite because it's got both, both negative and positives. It's German for hermaphrodite. Yes, but this article comes but you'll see later on um when i said you were talking about the uh, denarians or something and the early humans yeah from um, the cave yeah put it in this article um and then what they're doing is analyzing the dna from ancient and modern humans to create a family tree for everyone yeah it's interesting um it's Dennis now, Haben, isn't it? Yeah. that's the word yes um <laughs> it's possible to sequence all of your dna for about the cost of a smartphone this will reveal your unique genetic makeup and can be used to work out the similarities and differences between yourself and other people around the world at a genetic level. But how can you make sense of this information and what does genetic variation tell you? There's all this article about that. Um, if we could learn from G this genealogy and decipher where and when we live, when they live, we could uncover all the history written in our genes how ancestors moved around the world and the evolutionary processes that created us all. A uh, Herculean task. <laughs> um, without the genomes know. of everyone who ever lived, what could we possibly know about people who lived thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago? So <laughs> they approached the task by devising a series of elegant computer algorithms which take genetic similarities oh, yeah, and differences yeah, yeah. in their data set yeah. of many individuals and yeah. accurately reconstruct relationships between them. So, building this approach, <laughs> using this approach, we described recent revolution among 215 diverse human populations from varying times and geographic locations. The genealogy, lines of descent from our common ancestors, include the genomes of 3,601 people from three separate data sets. Other three separate data sets are explained later on. Um, 
here's the word and there's over it then then is over um, okay. so they're talking about neanderthals and another group called afam siva Up and, Earth, yeah, well. and they, these are the three these are the three um things they talk about where's it, where's it say that's three and there's one they've never found any any uh, remains of but they think yeah. there's another one but it's only been seen in the dna that's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? They, they found it in the DNA, but they, they never found any evidence of it. In, uh, in, yeah, I think in that's in here as well. It, tell, it tells you all that in here. Yes. Is it there? Tree, but a series of linked trees, we call them a tree sequence. So several family trees joined together. Um, 13 contains a lot of 13 million trees, and 27 million common ancestors for each of these. We examine estimated times and ge geographical locations. Right, having got that far, okay. <laughs> they then said, we have created an interactive plot showing the estimated ages of the common ancestors of different populations. It shows links between African populations and non-African populations to see the effect of the so-called out of Africa event, when a set of humans migrated from Africa to Eurasia and so on. So what they've got down here is this globe and this shows the um, going backwards in time, or one way or the other, this, the, the orange ones are the latest and the bluer ones are the oldest. So, oldest that's, one, yeah. so it's newer going that way. I can't get my hand around The newest that. going to the oldest. And you can run it as a video somewhere down here. There's a video of this here, I think it is. If I expand it before I even start it, it'll be better. There you go. This. Um, Yes, this is the Unified Geology, Genealogy and Med Modern Ancient Genomes Supplementary Video number one, right? So it starts off, uh, where's it gone? <laughs> lost it. Oh, we still, we haven't lost it, it's still coming up, it's coming up. There, if I, I've stopped it now. That shows the first 300 years uh, and zero generations. So that's where we are almost at, at the current time, I think not the past, the present. present. So the, people, the people in America, Africa, Europe, right down to New Zealand. Uh, if you watch those, it's quite interesting. As time passes, you see them spreading out or coming in, if you like. But they've done it back to front, really, which has puzzled me. So here we are, five, five, five and a half thousand years ago, 200 oh, years later. Oh, that's brilliant. And these, these little red dots are flying over here, right over the top of the world. And this, these, these ones fly out of New Zealand and disappear. And those from Australia go off and disappear. Um, Africa's mm -hmm. a way to look, of course. You keep watching that. Yeah. See them, the American red ones go over the top and the brown ones disappear off into the green <laughs> ones. <laughs> <laughs> So we are at, we are at 30, 34,000 years ago. Nothing oh, left yeah. in America, really. Zero yeah. in New Zealand. And carrying on. <laughs> yeah. I'll just let it run now to the end. Yeah. There, there was a, some research which said that the human population went down to just 100 or 200 at one stage. Yeah, down to that and, dot that disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and it, we, we practically, we practically wiped off the face of the earth, but only a hundred or two had left or something. And they did yeah. that from this, but I don't know where, it's, where how true it was. Why, why they run that graph that way around? I don't know. I'd rather have had it the other way around, where it started in Africa and went out. <laughs> went out was, yeah. Um, I suppose we could reverse the video, perhaps. So that was another interesting thing. Yeah, it's, it's good that. And this one is future cities could be 3D printed. This is uh, from the conversation, which yeah, I really like. Um, Peter, was the previous article from the conversation? Yes, it was. Huh. Um, future cities could be 3D printed with concrete made with using recycled glass. So what they do is crush the glass up into, into minute particles, much the same size as sand, and they replace sand with crushed glass. And of course, glass is made of sand, mm. is it not? <laughs> Nevertheless, at the moment, um, we have landfill is 35% of it is glass thrown away. So, 
So we've seen the waste, obviously. Um, this concrete is a mixture of cement, water, and aggregates, such as sand. Um, we re we trialed at replacing 100% of the aggregate with a mix of in the mix with glass. Simply put, glass is produced from sand. It's easy to recycle and can be used to make concrete without any complex processing. Demand from the construction industry could also ensure the glass is recycled. In 2018, the US only a quarter of glass was recycled, more than half going to landfill. So, they use brown, brown glass, beer, beer bottles, um, and they crushed it down to about the size of a millimeter. And then they used it to, use it to make um, and make concrete. Um, mm. So here's one they have designed uh, using concrete. This way, glass waste glass can find a new life as a construction material. The presence of glass not only solves the problem of waste, but contributes to the development of a concrete with superior performances. Mm. For instance, the thermal conductivity is lower, uh, so we get better better insulation in houses. <clears throat> so that's one thing, um, and it's uh, what's the more sustainable material. Oh yes, replacing some of the Portland cement. <clears throat> Apparently that's a real nasty for the environment um, uh, when you mix it. When you mix ordinary Portland cement, leads to this release of carbon dioxide as well as other greenhouse gases, accounting for eight percent of all carbon dioxide emissions in the world. That's Portland cement for you. <coughs> Limestone is less hazardous, still does it, of course. Um, so they're using that instead of Portland cement in concrete without a reduction in quality of the printing mixture. So here's what, how it mixes it up or how they print it. They've also added, light, this is interesting, they also added lightweight fillers made from yellow thermoplastic spheres to reduce the density of the concrete, which reduces the weight of it, obviously. And um, how, how quick are the 3D printers these days in doing, creating that sort of volume? I think they're fairly quick. They're fairly quick. They're supposed quick. to be building a house in Holland, 3D yes. printing a house in Holland with mm -hmm. 3D and um, with making blocks, 3D blocks. I don't know how it's progressed, but that was quite a few years ago. They started oh, yeah. it. They also did one in China, didn't they? A whole did house. They did they have to build it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, there are there are lots of links you can find, all that sort of thing, um, Peter. If you wish to go and look at that, I did find some. I haven't I haven't put them on as a link. So it's getting to ten to twelve. We better move on to this next one. Uh, yes, I kept coming across when I was using the register, uh, Richard. It yeah. kept using yeah. the word on prem and off prem, and I thought, what the hell are they talking about? Um, so I, I went on to off-prem, on-prem to, to get to here, um, and it talks about on-premises software, and then it talks about off-premises software, and, and the uh, that's re using a remote facility such as the cloud. So off-prem means the things are stored in the cloud, and on-prem means it's stored in a computer somewhere. I don't know, it doesn't seem to make much sense at all computers, are they? Um, well, I don't know why they call it the clay, because it's only a comp computer, and it could be the one stood right next to you, for all you know. I know, I know, I know. That's what that just was sort of slightly baffling. Um, the, the talk, you, you go to the internet and you see the conditions, why this is and why that, what's the relationship between on-prem and off-prem. Oh, they do love to make these expressions that you don't really understand. Just clever Apple marketing, isn't it, the cloud? Yeah, well, I suppose yeah. on-prem means that you, if you're a manufacturer, you've got the computer on your premises and you can control <coughs> it and nobody else can see it. But it's just off-prem, you're a little bit out of, it's not quite in your control. Um, but how do you link it? Oh, well, how does the cloud link, link it? it? Um, well, I'm trying to find the on off prem bit. I thought it was on there somewhere. Corporate players. Hmm. Oracle says. Uh, yeah, so a lot of this article again. Blimey, it's huge, huge article. <laughs> anyway, 
Anyway, um, we'll have a look at off-prem and on-prem. It's what you get when you go to the register, this thing that Richard uses quite a lot. Um, this is a very worrying uh, article. Oh, yeah. The British government oh, wow. suggests we hand our passports to social media companies. And the next phrase, I don't understand, block buttons would become mandatory under the forthcoming online safety bill. So the British government are going through, through the parliament at the moment, they've got this thing called the online safety bill. And in it, it is suggested that you, one of the laws is that you will pass out your, all your information to, to um, Facebook, for instance. Good oh, God. I can't believe it, but it's, it's all here. Um, Ridiculous. Oh, no, On the other hand, all this information is known at the moment because when you go to an airport, you put your passport on the thing and it scans it and it knows all about you. Well, that's true, I suppose. Oh, yes. that's spooky. <laughs> but anyway, this is apparently it's for safety. Would you put the online safety bill? Wouldn't be safe, would it? There may be more to it than we can understand, I suppose. Um, of DCMS, a <coughs> digital cultural culture, digital culture, media, and sport. That doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? No. That's, that's Nadine, isn't it? Nadine, our friend Nadine Dorris. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, another legal duty to be imposed on social media platforms will be the requirement to give users a block button, something that has been part of most of today's platforms since their launch. But do you know how to use the block button and when should you use it and when shouldn't you? That's the problem. I have no idea. Absolutely no idea at all. Um, it's like plastic cookies, haven't you? You can't always block those, can you either? Well, no, because you don't get it. If you block them, you don't get whatever it is it's trying to show you. No. It, I mean, I, I, there was a move to stop those. Well, Google was going to give them up, wasn't it? Have they done that? I don't think so. Because I've got a program where it just says get rid of cookies and it gets rid of all of them and you find you've got 500 megs of cookies. Yeah. Can you still use the sites though? No. No, well, you can't. Uh, yes, yes and no. It downloads them a second time round, that's all. <laughs> uh, yeah, cookies are yeah, a well, bloody nuisance. So they're fresh every time in effect? Yeah. Yes, assuming you delete them. Well, I mean, they're there to store your information, which is a bit... When they're all about this, you know, security, it's storing your date of birth, your name, your email address, and all the rest of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Anyway... Your bank fact, card, usually. Two-factor authentic, authentication is another thing they've brought in, haven't they, recently? Oh, that drives you mad. That's, oh, it's telling me. That is stupid, that is. Yeah, just just to log into Google nowadays, you have to get have to have a smartphone, or else you can't do it. Basically, I uh, would bugger it. You can use others. So, anyway, like, the well, fir like the firm that hosts my website, I now can't not have it as a secure website, and you got to pay twenty nine pound a year for the privilege to make it secure. Yeah. Good God. I thought this line was interesting. The online safety bill was renamed from the online harms bill shortly before the formal <laughs> introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not telling the truth. Yeah, that was a bit near the near the near the the bone, wasn't it? Online harm. It widely accepted as a disaster in the making by the technically literate. Yeah. Critics have said the bill risks creating an algorithm-driven censorship future. Oh, sounds awful. <laughs> When you look at all this stuff, how many MPs know anything about this and why are they making laws about it when they don't know anything about it? I know, no, it's sorry. terrible. It's terrible. They have advisors, Richard. That's the ah, answer. sorry, I should have known. Yeah, they've got Google and Microsoft to advise them, you know, for oh, all yeah. sorts of people. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, all, yeah. All the best people. Oh, yeah, all, all the really, really honest people of the world. Yeah, like, like Putin, for instance, I presume he's honest. Yeah, of course. Yes, he never does anything. <laughs> <laughs> it also could be uh, linked to strong rhetoric discouraging end to end encryption for the sake of minors. <sighs> Isn't that baffling? Oh, yeah. Um, no, no. And parliamentary efforts at properly scrutinizing the draft bill 
then led to scrutineers instead of publishing a manifesto asking for even stronger legal weapons to be included. So we've got scrutineers now. Hmm. So the, so the current state of the social media is unacceptable, proponents say. With all kinds of grisly and abusive posts, pictures and videos, ever only a few clicks away. Yes. Well, I don't know what you think about that. I think it's terrible. Absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, gone too far, really, haven't we? We should have done yeah. this, you know, a few steps back. And now it's got out of hand. Anyway, there's, a, there's 185 comments down here you can have a look at. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, some of them are right. <laughs> oh, it's terrible reading those as well. Right, well, that's, that's I'm afraid, all I've got for you today. <laughs> I hope it was oh, no, a That was brilliant. Yeah. I'll yeah. stop sharing. Yes, see where you're still yeah. there. Hello, Peter, you're still there. <laughs> yeah. fast asleep, yeah. He is really fast asleep, isn't he? So we bored you, Alan. <laughs> right, I'm going to stop the recording now while I remember it.